Hey, Sudeep, thank you for coming in. You're doing such great work. I mean, you've got a lot of uh, tremendous background, you know, working with different companies and a leadership role in AI and just uh, producing so much. And uh, it was such a pleasure to meet you recently as well. And we're going to explore some of the work that you're doing. So again, uh, thank you. Thank you, Stephen, for inviting me for this great opportunity. Looking forward so to our discussion. So, Sudeep, you know, what, what are two or three inflection points that made this sort of wonderful uh, inventor, innovator, entrepreneur that you are today? Look, so if you look at my career, I started my career in research and development in, in, back in India uh, in a firm called Tata. Um, <laughs> so I've been, I've been st started uh, my career with, uh, with, with the opportunity to see how technology can impact uh, in the larger scope of things. And post that, I joined IBM Research, which actually opened my mind to look <laughs> at different possibilities. And was so fortunate to work with the best brain of the world. My colleagues were so talented in one side and so motivated to driven by the passion of using building technology, which can change the world in a different way. So, and that's one of the seed why I moved to choose research as my primary career. I quit my job, I did my PhD in machine learning at that point in time, it was still not the era of AI. Um, and then postdoctorate in big data analytics, applying machine learning in solving complex data-driven mm -hmm. solutions. So since then, uh, I already been um, I, I've been always res inspired by things happening at the entrepreneurial world. Even during the P P my PhD time in my university, uh, Trento, which is in Italy, we had a course called entrepreneurship, and where <laughs> I participated uh, with my colleagues, and we, um, we 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 had different kind of competitions, and I used to win all almost like all, all the time. And since then I thought like, you know, this could be uh, the next phase for my life, like taking research to actually solve a real problem and then build a business which can make it sustainable so that I can reach out to more people in a better way than just being a researcher I can achieve, I, I can reach out to. And, um, you know, since then, um, I've been searching for opportunities where I can wear an entrepreneurial hat. And that opportunity came to me three and a half years ago when uh, I was part of another um, AI first company, Fractal. And I had a chat with the chairman and he said, like, why don't you start something bigger than what you are doing as a chief data scientist? And I said, okay, that's a great opportunity. I always been thinking about when to start. This might be the right opportunity. We started Eugenie.ai as an incubated company within that company. Well, the history of Eugenie is a little different. We started um, to build a company which can help enterprise to solve data-driven issues, right? For example, most of today, most of the world today, uh, especially enterprise world, they're not currently in the issue of um, lack of data, but they have so much data. Now it's an issue of indigestion of data. They don't know how to extract uh, right inside out of the data. And with that concept, we started Eugenia's, how can we build a platform which can ingest data, and, uh, you know, data that is coming with a high throughput, high volume, high velocity, and how do you make sense out of it using uh, as a AI as an intermediate platform? Now, from there, though we started, um, soon I realized, and just before COVID, and I, you know, I was actually at that point in time diagnosed with um, one specific issue, autoimmune uh, issue about um, uh, liver autoimmune uh, issues, and I tried to trace it back the root cause of it, it seems like toxicity in the environment, toxicity in our food and everything are impacting um, our body not to act with some of the things, toxin that is coming in, 
in the right way. And that's why the body has started not recognizing it properly and then started uh, behaving against our own body's immune system. And it is not that I'm the only person in the world having that issue. It seems like it's on the rise, uh, the trend. That's one part of it. And it seems like environment is major cause for it. Uh, so we as a human being are not been tuned to address issues such as high toxicity in the environment. And of course, I was been born. Um, I was in. I, I was. Uh, I was born in India. You know, in, in city metro cities. Of course, there are a lot of toxicity there uh, in the environment. A lot of environment pollutions and whatnot. And it's and second uh, incident that happened interestingly at that point in time. I'm also a father. And I was teaching my daughter at that point in time, uh, some of the animals at that time, she was three years old. And soon we realized, I, I realized that most of the animals, Arctic animals are endangered. Um, and not because of natural selection, but because of the fact the human made disaster, which is climate change, forcing them uh, to be extinct. And it's not few animals, it's all of us, my daughter's generations and the generations afterwards would be in danger if we don't act, react now. And of course, the only superpower that as a father I have uh, is technology. Like I am, I, I, I only understand technology well. I'm not a politician, I'm not a uh, uh, influencer that way. So I thought how to use technology as a way to create something which in some way will try to impact climate uh, change mitigation side. Um, and maybe technology is the only way by which you can scale anything that you want to do at a, climate, at, at a global scale, at a planet scale. With that vision, we started envisioning, we kind of from generic AI uh, platform uh, to be specific, how to use that same platform in order, order to address climate as an issue. And then how to use data as a way by which helping companies to understand, enterprise today, understand better about how much they're emitting, what are the root cause behind the emissions, and how they should run their operations in a better way, quote unquote, thereby they can achieve sustainability which will impact both their own kpis up you know whether it's throughput whether it's profitability and etc um environment um because they will emit less they will produce less wastages and then and then community as a whole like people around those uh, those organizations people who are working for this industry uh organizations so the toxicity and other aspects can also be reduced, which is like work related hazards. So with that mission, we started Eugenia and we've been fortunate to work with some of the largest oil and gas mining companies so far. Yeah, that's, I know uh, that was quite a quite lengthy answer to your question, but this is how Eugenia has become what it is today. Um, we had a long three years history uh, behind its inception to wh where we are today. So let's unpack some of um, what you talked about, you know, like you, you know, some of your early inflection points, and then we'll go back to Eugenie. So we'll go, we'll go back to, you know, you're you're um, ten years old or you're five years old. What got you interested in, or were you interested in science at the time? I mean, what was that journey like? Yeah. So, um, so again, uh, my education happened all in India. Um, and in my family, there was no one uh, who was in science. <laughs> Most of my family members are in, in humanities, like they are all professional lawyers and, uh, and similar background. Um, I have never seen someone uh, in my family uh, talking about science on a daily day-to-day -day basis. And first, <laughs> I remember my uh, since my ch in my childhood, my first motivation come from a uh, from a television series, 
uh, which is called um, Johnny Soko and Flying Robots. It's a Japanese series which used to run in Indian on Indian te televisions. The sci-fi actually attracted me um, to think about, you know, how to build machines which can make human uh, having a better power than what they have today. Um, so in, in, in a way, like, of course, uh, uh, everywhere it is good versus evil, where the character, the main character in that series was uh, a, ch a child, I mean, not child, a young boy who wants to help uh, others um, in their distress. And then he used a robo robot or machines, which eventually helps him to be a better, um, to help other people better. So I always thought like science is something which is a medium which helps human being to be a better being and make the world a better place. And throughout uh, my career, that's how I have seen science and that's the respect um, for me towards science. Um, well, during, of course I chose engineering as my career background, uh, as my professional uh, courses and I did my, uh, my engineering from India. Uh, well, at that point in time, I thought like maybe I'll be um, a techie who will focus on building uh, the layers of management and technology together. That's what, what, what I was thinking in my mind. But the moment I joined companies like organizations like Tata and IBM, to be specific, um, my perception towards technology changed completely <laughs> say um, I had the fortunate uh, fortune to work with some of the best mathematicians uh, physicists a chemist well as a ke chemistry uh, scientist while I was in IBM research that's a that's the kind of new world to me how to use and they have been that point in time been <coughs> researching on molecular um, uh, neurology in one side, molecular biology in the other side, and similar. And and getting inspired by those, and you know, some of these concepts bringing into um, computer science is something of which I was working on. Um, some of the early uh, concept around um, neural network, inspired by. The other concept, which is in, in neuroscience and other style, like I, I've been exposed to those kind of scientists who have they got Turing Award and whatnot in those fields. And that IBM gave me that le leverage. And fortunately, I was also working with a few of uh, my mentor in IBM uh, who have been continuously helping me at that point in time uh, to understand as a professional how. I can think beyond the immediate project and think beyond immediate object and think uh, science as a domain, think um, technology like computer science as a way to achieve bigger thing. And during PhD, again, completely opened up my mind in a different way, say that, okay, uh, then I realized that the world of knowledge is so vast and the way you can achieve is by sharing. It's the concept of knowing by sharing knowledge is something which uh, I kind of captured during my PhD time. When my professor, uh, uh, well, I did my PhD in, in Europe, but a uh, lot of visiting professors used to come from, from the US, like from Yahoo Research Lab, from Microsoft Research Lab. Um, so they also inspired me a lot understanding what they are building um, as, a, as a software, helping the way people behaving differently. For example, how do you nudge? Of course, my PhD was in recommender system. So all the concept that we have been trying to evangelize at the point in time, how do you build that cooperative system between human and machines? By doing that, you are nudging people to have better behavior uh, in terms of uh, whether choosing a specific um, 
you know, spe specific uh, uh, buying patterns or choosing a specific um, other other kind of patterns in in different uh, domains like uh, whether someone is building softwares how do you how do i reuse my code better than how it uh, you know without creating uh, reinventing the wheel how i can reuse resources better so those kind of nudging behavior which can help someone to make a better ecosystem have been always uh, has always intrigued me and that's what i chose as a kind of applied space in which i applied my physics uh, my sorry phd um, theoretical impact um, so yeah so th those actually the foundations which helped me to think science think technology beyond its immediate impact and think see the bigger picture and try to fit how human technology uh, and the, all the other system system uh, ecosystem can build that cooperative uh, ecosystem which can help all of us together and having a bigger impact so yeah stephen so you know what I'm hearing is you, you came from a background where you, where you don't your family isn't in science right so so uh, you were like an outlier in the family because you have this sort of science orientation but you also would because you're surrounded by humanity sort of this humanities orientation it, it, you'll have a human component in there right uh, and that would shape you even though you're you have this mathematics and science. Uh, background and in fact your education is that way and then your jobs at Tata or IBM it's all sort of very uh, technology but it's translational technology translational meaning let's not do it for just pure research but let's see if it's something that we could do to apply it to solve some problem and do some solution that will be the for the benefit of humanity in some way or or the world in some way so that then led, so I'm just thinking about this, uh, that led you to you know, your, your tech leadership positions with Fractal AI, uh, with IBM, with Tata, which you mentioned, uh, with uh, Rakuten, and, uh, and, but you also did some work in academic institutions, right? Like in Paris and, uh, or I IT. I okay, IT. so, you, yeah, and then you, so you got all of this background, and you got this humanities aspect, which is family related. And so what, what inspired you to say, you know what, I'm going to start a company. You're like, what, what was the catalyst for that? Yeah. So I, as I was mentioning before, uh, starting a company for me was, uh, it was more passion than I always planned for it. Like I wanted to build something which ha will have a bigger impact, which otherwise I cannot achieve, just be a researcher in a research lab or being a professor in an institution, uh, professional. So, uh, so, a, so let me interrupt then. Uh, okay, so so now you you think, okay, I want to start a company, but you know, you you got these jobs that pay you, right? And that's that's how you survive, right? That's how you live. And then you start a startup. That's a big move because then you leave that safety net of having salaries and th when things come in. Or did you do them? Did they coexist for a bit before you said, you know what, I'm going to do this full time? Yeah. So uh, from from economy point of view, like I was fortunate, of course, uh, I did not have to quit everything and then start from scratch. Fractal chairman, I was mentioning before. So he called me up saying, why don't you incubate? Incubate means like, you already have the safety net of a bigger net. Uh, so where it's not that you are really every day thinking about how do I hire people to, and how do I pay their salary? Uh, the working capital coming anywhere from the bigger net, bigger company, Fractal gave me that, um, that platform so that I could think about building business while not worrying about day-to-day, -day, uh, you know, money for starting the company uh, from the take from the takeoff side. Um, so they have they are incubator as well as investor in Eugenia as we speak today. So Eugenia uh, Fractal is 
has invested more than uh, four million dollars in in India, uh, sorry, in Eugenie, um, so that we have the working capital so, uh, to take off. Now that that was one aspect of it, uh, but you know, if you ask me the question like, what if you did not have fractal at that point in time? Would have, would you have started Eugenie again? I said, yeah, I would have said yes. Because most of the entrepreneurs are today who are existing, uh, of course, there will, there's always a risk factor it, in it, um, but you are driven by passion. It was not different in case of Eugenie. We wanted, I wanted to create something at that point in time and I had a discussion, a long discussion with uh, the chairman of Fractal about um, addressing the issue, which today, what I believe that is not addressed the way it should be. Now, the hypothesis around clean tech, cl carbon, uh, you know, climate tech, is how people are seeing it and how I see it. I saw a difference and I felt like, why are we doing the way we are doing it? The world requires a better solution. Um, and that kept me up at night. And I feel the need that if we, if I don't do it, um, the generations that are coming next will be suffering. And at least I can't sit idle without thinking about all this, you know, safety net. Can I be, uh, you know, working CEO of another company, maybe big company at that point in time, I had that opportunity as well. Um, but shall I do that, choose that, or start from scratch and build something which does not exist? I chose this and you have to take that choice. You have to, maybe I did not put money from my pocket, but what I put from my pocket was an option of being a CEO of a very big company. I can't name that company, very, very big company versus building something from scratch which does not exist and will go through its own uh, journey. I chose a second because I thought like the first one can be solved by anyone else. The other company where they want me to work on. But the second one, if I don't solve it, what I'm thinking will never see uh, the day of the life. And that's the reason why um, I started Eugenie. And I, I don't repent. Um, and that's how it is. <laughs> you know, that's, again, that's really, really interesting. You know, so, you know, you, you're, you have the science orientation, your family is more humanities, you, you get an education, a really great education, you end up working with different uh, science oriented companies or companies who have a really technical orientation. You get mentored by the chairman of Fracto and he, he gives you, or he or she gives you the opportunity and says, you know what? You, you can do something, you can create a company and we'll support you. That's the, and at the same time, you had this offer to be the CEO of a notable company. And so that's a big decision, right? Because that's like totally, total security. Right? If you become the CEO of a notable company or if you start a startup, because a startup has risks, right? Even though you have some financial support and it's incubated and so on. So that's, that's an interesting uh, journey. And then, and so for the benefit of the audience who, who do startups, um, how did you pick your team? Yeah, I think that's the most important part. <laughs> and if you're, especially if you're starting for the first, if you're not, if you're a serial entrepreneur anyway, you know it, how to pick the team. But if you're built, you know, building your first startup, mm -hmm. I think oftentimes um, you probably have read hundreds of places, but I can tell you from my first time, uh, first hand experience that I think that's the most important initial decisions uh, that you have to make. Uh, you gotta be so careful about choosing your founding team. Um, it's almost twice as complex as um, choosing your life partner. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so in life matter in case you, you got to choose one, but like, you know, at, at a time maybe, but in case of founding team members, you got to choose multiple. It's not one founding member is good enough um, so that you build that, build the initial seed well, um, uh, you know, so it becomes organization. Uh, what we, 
I did, uh, did at a point in time. Uh, I it, it's not one shot. Like I made a couple of mistakes, so I. <laughs> um, you got to go through this iteration process, right? Um, but from a number side, I can say that never think of initial founding team more than 10 uh, because then you spend more time in people management than focusing on um, the actual business idea and, and doing the product market fit, um, you know, those kind of experimentations. Uh, the first five, 10 members of the core to your company, uh, because they will hire eventually. And then from 10, it will become 30, 30 to 100. The growth would be that way uh, in the future, maybe two or three years down the line. So first 10 members are very important. So they said the pace of the company, they said the mindset, the culture of the company. And the second aspect, I would say before hiring, define the culture of the company, the values of the company. So in our case, uh, our values were the following, right? So we say um, we are a company for creating impact. So people who are driven by impact should be part of Eugene. It doesn't matter uh, what they know, what matters is what they wish to know. Uh, <laughs> and how do you find that what they wish to know? Like, are they driven by passion or they are driven by uh, by money. Um, so if your founding team, uh, team members are driven by money, so think of it, of course, in our case, it was different. We could afford to give them salary. There were companies who cannot afford, you know, driven by passions is the only thing that you can see only uh, equity. So in our case, we can make it money and equity. So they didn't have to really risk uh, their career and come here. They were gen they were getting uh, they are getting industry level salary while still being in a startup. So if you are not driven by passion and only by money, you get money, but like the output that you can, you are expecting from there uh, will not come because they think it's just a job, you know, nine to five and whatnot. I will not think beyond what's been given to us. Uh, your founding team team member should be. Uh, 10 founders coming together and building this company. Um, equal passion, equal focus on the topic. So so I, we'd, I defined the values first for the company and then started hiring. And part of that was also transparency is very, very important. Um, and those values always, again, come from top down. Unless you practice it, you cannot expect other people to do it. If I'm not transparent, I cannot expect my uh, other CXOs to be transparent to me as well. So uh, those are different way by which uh, you try to understand um, people wh whom you are hiring, whether they, the, the way they perform their work, like are, how transparent they are, they were in the past life as well with their colleagues uh, while communicating their work, while communicating their issues, um, concerns because you know when you were working as a team there would be concerns uh you know how openly you communicate about the, your concerns and then sort it out is a very important aspect oftentimes what happens is we as a human being tend to um uh tend to kind of pass through uh conflict and that's why we don't discuss very openly about things that are bothering us uh which is really a very complex scenario for a startup. You've got to be, have a very open communication among every team member so that they don't ever feel the need um, to put something like, okay, I'm feeling this way, but I cannot communicate uh, to my colleagues because I don't know whether, how will they react or how will they feel? So that kind of open channel you got to build uh, in order for everyone to communicate openly and to do that again, you got to make sure that people are vulnerable as well. Like it's not that I was always right. Um, you know, people who tend to believe I'm always right often becomes a bottleneck for startups growth. So again, those are values which are part of Eugenie's core value. Um, and basis those values, we kind of, uh, I hired the first five employees and then they hired the next five employees 
And so far, currently, we are 35 members team. Every people who joined, who has joined Eugenie so far, been always evaluated on values, the topmost priority, then their core strength, uh, and then uh, their more, you know, their motivations to join Eugenie. All of this coming together, and then we hired them. I think those um, team members are the main reason, more than me, uh, where we are today. And I'm very proud of my team uh, because they are building something which is going to make the world a better place. Yeah. So I can tell. So you went through a re really kind of thoughtful process of founding your company. You wanted people who are passionate, uh, who are committed uh, to this journey with you, and like you said, it's actually maybe even more complex than finding your life partner <laughs> uh, and going through this process. In a way, it's a marriage, isn't it? It's it's a it's a marriage when you start a company, and you spend a lot of time with the people and you indicated transparency is really important. You have to be really honest with each other as you go through this journey uh, on, on this founding team and how important that founding team is, right? And then and then you, um, and I guess you're uh, choosing people too that you wanna bring in that bring in different skill sets uh, to complement the skill sets you have. And so you, you cover the entirety of what the requirements will be as you're building your your company, how, how are you able to uh, start to scaling process? Like you've got some pretty big companies that are your clients. How are you, how are you able to do that recruiting? And, you know, and I should mention to the audience, you already mentioned this already, but you, uh, you bring uh, technology to asset heavy manufacturing companies to decarbonize their operations. And you do this by tracking, tracing, and reducing carbon emissions and footprint by um, improving operational efficiency. And you do that because you've got an enterprise AI software as a service platform, operational emissions intelligence, and you use explainable AI and, you know, uh, industry four or five technology. You've got IoT and remote sensing and so on. So you're integrating all of this in your platform and your software as a service. And you have this AI as this way of knitting all the pieces together. Ultimately, I'm a company and I'm gonna improve my efficiencies and therefore I'm gonna reduce my carbon emissions and things like that. So, cause I'll get a dashboard, it'll tell me, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, how I could improve my efficiency and so on. How did you recruit your first uh, clients? How, how, you know, what was that process? Yeah. Um... So of course, like every, again, every startup will go through the same, right? Uh, I've never heard of Eugenie.ai and I'm a big oil and gas company. How would I trust you? The first <laughs> question always mean is, how do right. I trust you? Um, so, and of course I'm not coming from that asset heavy background. I, I came from technology background. It's not that my network could help <laughs> me to uh, get those trust anyway. So what we chose uh, at that point in time, we thought like, let's prove our credibility. What we're good at, we knew that at that point in time, our algorithms, AI algorithms are pretty um, strong because we benchmark against, at that point in time, whatever it was there in, uh, in kind of in industry or in academia, uh, whatever benchmark that we get to see in conference and whatnot. So let us prove ourselves better than them using those existing benchmarks, whether it's accuracy, whether it's uh, other KPI that for algorithm uh, benchmark, you use it. We benchmark ourselves we patented for uh, our technology, core technology AI in the US. Uh, we published our papers in conferences. We got best paper and et cetera. So those were, made us believe that we can really apply what we're building in real industrial scenario. Then we say the second phase is, let us prove it by uh, having a head on, comp getting into, into head on competition against our, comp against our peers in this space. So most of this uh, heavy industry also hosts a lot of industrial corporate innovation challenges. Um, for example, we won 
Nexa Mining Challenge in, in Brazil, which they hosted, um, you know, annually they hosted. And uh, when we participated, close to 400 odd companies participated for five different uh, uh, ch challenge track they had. Um, and out of that, they selected five and Eugenie was one of them. And similarly, we did for other mining company, all of companies. So we took part on those challenges. We won those challenges. As a part of it, we got a POC. As a winning um, surprise, you get a POC, whether paid or non-paid. Again, mm -hmm. so we got luckily paid proof of concept uh, for three months where we had proven the value that Eugenie could bring, different, the differential of value. Of course, during the winning process, you had to prove that. But before, beyond that, when you get that opportunity of running a paid pilot, we had proven the value of Eugenie, what we propose and what we could deliver. And that eventually uh, helped them to gain the trust on us and give us bigger project than what we could get otherwise. And that has been our strategy, one of the main strategy by proving our value, uh, not just by saying that I'm coming from the domain, but actually by showing them the real value by doing a pilot and giving them the confidence that yes, Eugenie team can show me those values, tangible values at a very, very high speed, high through, uh, you know, uh, speed of deployment. So today, wherever we are applying Eugenie, the first value uh, that they can see is um, out of coming out of the platform less than a month time. So, which is in this domain, uh, they have never seen the same. Mm -hmm. So they they kind of uh, ran pilots for more than years or at least three months in order to first see the insight coming out of the platform. Then they start benchmarking and then start evaluating the values. So. With Eugenie, the way we have built a platform, we could do that uh, much faster than our competitors, our peers. So that definitely differentiated us against our competitors. Um, so that was the reason why they start start trusting us, and then now they have started opening up, uh, you know, recommending us to other. Uh, say we started with innovation program. Typically, most of these innovation challenges are hosted by the innovation program management team. So they started then recommending Eugenie to the other counterpart in operations team and in, uh, in IT team and others. So this is the way we are entering the market and this is the way we are expanding um, by winning their trust bit by bit, one at a time. So uh, <clears throat> you received some financing from Fractal and that gave you um, a sub runway. And now you would have uh, and you got paid pilots, which uh, helps with your revenue. And because some of those paid pilots are converted into enterprise-wide or and even recommendations to other business units uh, within the companies who are your clients, then um, it, you, you would have now annual repeat revenue, what we call ARR. So... Are, are you at a point now where you can scale and you're profitable or are you still taking investment? What's that yeah. journey in your startup? And that would be a, a, a question that all startups have to think through themselves, right? You know, where they just not take investment, but they have enough revenue that they can sustain themselves and especially IPIDA, which is, you know, kind of like a profit measure, right? There's, there's actual... Uh, excess that can fuel their company as well, right? Yeah. No, we are not yet profitable, um, but we'll be profitable in the next two years. Um, why we're not profitable? Not because of this, but we also are spending a lot of money in our marketing and branding. Um, so that's needed because, again, we are unknown. We are not one of the big OEMs, uh, neither big tech companies who exist in this domain, like in automations manufacturing domain. We are coming from outside for <laughs> others to understand Eugenie better. Of course, there with corporate innovations, you have limited access to the market. 
It's not that every other company is running corporate innovations every other day. So you definitely need to speak to more, um, more prospects than what we, uh, what can be covered only by taking part in corporate innovation challenges uh, and similar. And that's why we, we have to spend a con good amount of money around um, go-to-market, sales, marketing, and similar. And that we have started spending from this year. Um, and hence, well, first one year in Eugenie, it was a beta positive because <laughs> we, we had proven and then uh, we got business and uh, you know we had smaller team then we realized that with that our growth would be limited to certain numbers we cannot achieve the way uh, we are seeing the business to create a global scale impact to create a global scale impact you got to have global presence as well and for global presence you also need to speak to the right people at the right time go to the right conference talk about eugenie evangelize Eugenie and show the world what else can be achieved um, with technology like Eugenie. And that's what we're spending this year. Uh, we have started spending. So that will come to a point where that investment will bring multi-fold growth for us. And it's going to hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll start seeing an exponential growth in next one year. And then that will help us to meet our cost and, and uh, profit uh, end of uh, two years. Like, uh, yeah, from two years from now, uh, we'll be, you know, positive. I mean, we'll be new, new net zero <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> and then we'll become positive. Yes, uh, our growth will be exponential from there onwards. Right. And, and, and so, um, and then you'll be, you think you're going to, move towards a merger acquisition? Do you want to be acquired or, or are you moving towards a public uh, offering or what's, what's your ultimate goal or it could be in anything that, uh, yeah. or you plan See, to keep it, keep the company? <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. And um, I think that's a question every founder uh, should have a great answer in their mind. <laughs> um, there are two ways. I, I mean, one thing is climate tech is a problem which is not a zero sum game. It's it's an ecosystem problem. Uh, it requires a lot of people to come together and do something which can eventually help. So to be honest, Eugenie is solving one part of the equa equation. So uh, what we are saying is these asset heavy companies, one of the major issues that they have is uh, at a source level, if they can reduce their emissions, of course, they don't have to spend a lot of money on offset. And eventually, that will motivate them to have better, um, you know, faster speed to achieve ne ne neutrality. And that will eventually help the world. And that's what we're doing. Now, think about if I draw a parallel, the other world, like healthcare. There are two types of businesses. One is Preventative healthcare, like all these genes and whatnot, right? So they're helping you to be better in your health so that you don't fall sick. Um, and there is other kind of uh, businesses, which is like once you fall sick, the Medicare and whatnot, insurance companies, healthcare companies, that will help you to recover faster. So we are on the first track where we're saying before you emit, how do you reduce your emissions in the very first place so that you don't have to now think about offset. Okay, I have to spend $80 per ton to uh, for reforestations or for carbon <laughs> direct carbon capture, right? So we are saying that, okay, before you make emissions, you can still reduce 30% of the emissions. But still, eventually you will, you will emit. Someone else will still have to do reforestation, still have to do direct air capture still have to do energy transition. So I believe if Eugenie, we be true to our mission, we cannot be selfish. We got to build an ecos help build an ecosystem, either acquiring others who can you know, finally you know, make the transition. Like once we make, uh, you know, we reduce the resource and then there still be um, some more which can be then offset by reforestation. So we got to have that whole ecosystem built or 
if we are not able to scale that fast that someone else is building we should be able to join that force so that we complete the narrative and story to help a company to achieve net neutrality than what they today aspire to achieve so in that question so it depends on how fast we are growing and how fast others are growing so wherever we see the uh, by joining the force can make the mission successful i um, will be happy to join that force if we grow and then we that said today if 3000 or 4000 companies are working on ugni and they want to solve the next problem of set if i want to acquire someone i should better acquire rather than just thinking about building everything by myself yeah so that's how it is the world requires very fast solution instead of building everything selfishly you know joining forces makes sense and that's why i'm part of ecosystem like united united nation um uh the the global compact or or similar kind of ecosystem where it gives you the liberty to know who also are part of that ecosystem so that if we can join together and build something much more valuable to the industry and to the society that is more useful than building everything by myself and taking more time in building you know world needs immediate solution it's not like after 20 years we'll, we'll build everything but no yeah in that way yeah and so what you're saying it's a multi stakeholder um problem and it's a multi stakeholder solution and everybody has to collaborate to address it it it's not one solution fits all it's a series of solutions an entire multiple ecosystems of solutions that ultimately will help to alleviate or at least mitigate some of the issues that you're mentioning from a climate standpoint or and carbon emissions and and more right and so uh and so that's that's a very uh um pragmatic approach as well and then a collaborative approach and and the world has to come together sometimes it's that's difficult we're we're in the last minutes here and this is the final question and that is you know what recommendations would you give to the audience uh you know you you've had a successful career as a researcher as a translational researcher translational just a reminder meaning to um convert research into practical solutions you've had leadership roles uh, and then you decided you know what i'm going to do a startup and you were careful in the founding of that startup and who you brought in as partners you decided to do something that would have impact that's bigger than just you know like being a ceo of a big company and things like that but uh you know as an entrepreneur you're doing value creation right from the from the ground from from scratch from nothing and then you're building it up and that's the greatest uh, kind of value creation you can have uh, especially when you are driven by passion to uh, to make a change to have a positive impact so you you've addressed all of those different pieces and then so you have a lot of wisdom and experience so what recommendations will you give to my audience and my audience has engineers in it it has students it has scientists and it, it has quite a few uh, ceos and investors as well so it's really a broad spectrum um because i do all of those things right uh, i mean uh, you know i work with academic organizations i work at the un as well so there'd be un in the audience so it, and i work with ceos and investors so it'd be a broad spectrum of people so what recommend it and maybe it's a tailored well for this audience i would say this for this i would say that or or maybe it's a bucket uh that that kind of transcends all the different sort of uh, communities that are in my audience yeah uh, that that's a quite a loaded question uh, <laughs> and to be honest very very honest i can uh, you know it may sound hum- humble but um but i don't think like i'm still i have learned and i can say that, okay i've learned uh, one topic very in depth that i can talk <laughs> about it and that could be because of i of course coming from academic background teaches you that humbleness that how little you know in the whole ocean <laughs> of knowledge right you be self aware i'm I'll, i can only talk about, i'm not an expert just to give an uh, you know word of caution take it as, with a pinch of salt that's my experience uh, my life experience i can share with you um what i feel like what is first important is each one of us need to understand uh the motivations why you want to choose a specific topic 
as a career, as a way of life. Work is eventually has become part of our way of life. We spend more time with work than uh, with our family. So we got to choose very carefully what would drive us so I can spend that much of time behind it. Um, and entrepreneurship is not for everyone. Uh, <laughs> Why? Because it's not, it, it, it's cool. Of course, you take something as a passion and make it happen. And if it is successful, it will create a lot of uh, economic impact as well as uh, other impact as well. But the problem is the journey is not straight line. It's, it's, <laughs> it's not at all a straight line. And oftentimes, um, you'll, every, as a CEO, you will always be uh, judged and often be misjudged. Uh, and and that's how your life is. And oftentimes, these are the reason why a lot of stress, um, unnecessary stress, cre- created in your mind. And you don't, you will not eventually not enjoy none of this, right? Neither <laughs> your your journey nor create creation journey. So, got to be very very clear about your passion, what drives you, and choose your career accordingly. Uh, whether you're a student, you want to be an or uh, you entrepreneur or where, whether you are already an entrepreneur uh, you want to be more successful than where you are I think uh, having the clarity in your own mind is very important that what do you want uh, your career to be and then accordingly choose and find right partners for that whether it's an investor um, who can who would trust uh, what you're building and having the same passion as you are, of course, uh, the aspect mm-hmm. of the passion might be different, but say for example, investor wants 20X return, but at the same time wants to create um, impact. Uh, and that impact is in line with what impact you want to create. They are the best uh, you know, partner for you. Uh, they will teach you things which you do not know. Um, and, and, and then hire right people so that uh, they can also help you to remove some of the uh, uh-huh. some of the responsibility that you have. Maybe you can offload and you know, build that team who together are solving that problem. Not only you, but a team together working towards making that problem. Because all of them are driven by the same passion. Maybe you are the first one to um, to to give an give words to that passion. That, that's why your mission is important. But finally, you could attract people with a similar kind of thought, join your team and build a team. And together, they are trying to solve the problem, uh, attack the problem. And in that team, don't dis- discard your family members. That's very important because they will have to support you. Otherwise, you cannot achieve it. Um, so make sure that you spend enough time um, bring everyone together. Uh, they will, all of them will see the same thing in different lenses, but you as a CEO, you as a founder, you as the first proponent of the idea must be able to communicate that well to the people and have that open conversations with all of them all the time uh, so that you can bring them all together on your board and they will help you to achieve your mission much faster than otherwise. Um, I mean, that's, I think, one piece of advice, mostly entrepreneurs, uh, to entrepreneurs. And uh, mental stress is real, I will tell you. It's, it is real because you're always working under uncertainty. Your customer will say, yes, I will sign that deal, but they will not. Your investor will say, yes, I'm sending you the, uh, the term sheet, but they will take their own time. This all, deal, uh, this all stress will happen all the time. But, um, you know, if you have those, uh, you know, cushion behind, like team, your family with whom you can discuss and you can uh, release your stress, I think that will be very, very helpful. So do consider that um, as, as a back channel for you to relieve your stress, like talking to people so that they, at least if they can't solve the problem, they will uh, hear you out and that will help you to uh, you know, find a better solution and at least for uh, your own stress and other decision related issues. Yeah. 
Uh, that's the suggestion or my life life learnings I can share with your audience. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, very valuable from a startup standpoint. Uh, it, when you do a startup and you're an entrepreneur, you have to be accepting of volatility, <laughs> right? As you indicated, it's not a straight line. It's ups and downs and ups and downs. There's a lot of churn and you have to be prepared for that. And that and that becomes a part of life, right? It's just a normal yeah. part of life. So, and, um, and you'll find that persistence and resilience are really important because you'll always find some kind of a solution, but you have to, but you can't quit. You have to stay at it. <laughs> right. So yeah, absolutely. This is another thing. Like, don't expect that you will be always doing the right thing. You will make mistakes, ex except that uh, you will be making mistakes on the way, but have the humility to learn from it and move on, have the persistence and stick to it and then find a better solution than what you found last time. <laughs> Exactly. So, you know, Sadeep, you, you shared so much with our audience, all so valuable from your uh, your uh, home life to, you know, when you were um, young, to your educational life, to your research life, to your entrepreneurship life, and lots of lessons of being an entrepreneur that are very practical as well to the audience. I'm an investor, so I know that, and I'm an entrepreneur, so I understand your journey so thank you again for coming in and sharing so many, uh, so much wisdom and experience with our audience. Thank you, Stefan. I so enjoyed the conversation. It seems like uh, I have revisited my down memory lane <laughs> again, and I can do things better than what I was doing. So thank you for again uh, opening up my eyes with your questions. So nice. Uh, thank you again. Okay. Thank you again. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience, and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website, www.tbcy.in, to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.